thank you for making it today. Uh, you see the weather. I'm coming from New York, and uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful and an honor to be here in such a uh, beautiful part of the country. So uh, thank you for uh, your attention this afternoon. So Dr. Butler very kindly invited me uh, today, and uh, tomorrow I'll be speaking about dermatologic toxicities during therapy. So what I wanted to do today, since it's a Friday afternoon, I'm sure all of you are very tired from a very long week of working long hours, I wanted to introduce you to this concept of dermatology uh, and uh, things that I consider to be important uh, to know if you are a non-dermatologist and perhaps could uh, be useful not only for your practices but also with your families and with, uh, with any of your patients. Uh, so I titled this lecture Dermatology for the Oncologist. So I will be saying some very basic things and I hope not to offend anyone as to how basic they will be. But I, as I hope you will see, they will build upon additional information to, um, to better understand tomorrow's lecture. So let's start first uh, as a matter of background uh, and in where dermatology and oncology intersect. It's important uh, to remember something that you know very well. The incidence of cancer worldwide is about 14.1 uh, million people. Uh, every year, approximately 8 million people die from cancer. Uh, this is excluding non-melanoma skin cancers. Uh, and uh, today, uh, it is thought that 30 million people live with a diagnosis of cancer. So 30 million cancer survivors throughout the world. And you can see there that the incidence of cancer with the darker blue indicating the highest incidence will v vary uh, being most prominent in uh, developed countries. Uh, similarly, uh, dermatologic diseases are not equally distributed throughout the world. Uh, it is uh, to estimate the impact of dermatologic disease in the world is not, this, is not uh, is, you, you cannot do this the same way you would do with, uh, with cancer because uh, most people do not die from dermatologic diseases. However, their lives can be significantly impaired and this is usually uh, measured uh, in, uh, as, a, as a unit of measure termed years of uh, life lived with a disability and how these years are lost. And this is a, a, a mathematic uh, algorithm that they have developed to estimate how these, these dermatologic conditions impact people. So from a, a paper that was published in one of our main uh, dermatologic journals called the Journal of Investigative Dermatology in 2013, uh, this paper highlighted that about 30 to 70 percent of people across the world are diagnosed with some type of dermatologic disease, uh, most frequently infectious diseases. Uh, it was considered to be the fourth non-fatal cause of disease burden amongst all diseases in the world. And it ranks between the second and the eleventh uh, cause of years uh, lived with uh, disability uh, in different countries across the world. So it is uh, easy to understand how uh, many of your oncology patients will not only suffer from dermatologic diseases even before they start therapy. And a study that was done in Turkey uh, in over 700 patients diagnosed with cancer prior to, the, to them receiving chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery showed that about 45 percent of your patients, even before they start treatment, they will have some type of dermatologic diseases disease, most notably um, skin infections, dry or itchy skin, as well as um, uh, inflammatory skin diseases. So you as oncologists, as uh, nurse practitioners and oncology nurses, you see uh, the disease in your patients as a series uh, of uh, proteins and pathways that uh, you can block through the use of monoclonal antibodies or small molecules, and thereby reverting to a benign or controlled phenotype in the majority of your patients. And this has led to the remarkable advances in cancer and decrease in cancer deaths across most cancers in both men and women. But also from a dermatologic perspective, what it looks like to me is that you are targeting the skin. Because the same pathways or proteins that you are blocking uh, with the so-called targeted therapies as seen here, or with cytotoxic agents, or with immune checkpoint inhibitors, as you can see here, you will also be targeting the skin because all of these pathways are critical for the normal homeostasis and functioning of the skin. And let's go into the basics of what really is the skin as an organ. But before that, I just wanted to emphasize that as to why it is important, and I thank Dr. Butler again for inviting me, for you as oncologists or oncology nurses to know about skin in your patients. 
The truth is only about 8% of cancer patients ever get referred to a dermatologist, and this occurs because of various reasons. We have established a system at our institution in which the oncology healthcare provider refers to us. We see patients the same day, we evaluate them, and we communicate with the oncology healthcare provider the same day. And I have to say that in the majority of cases, uh, the attribution of a uh, patient's dermatologic condition or the severity will differ from that uh, that it was, was uh, established by the oncologist. So I think that certainly we can add to the, uh, to the rem remarkable care and contributions that you do to your patients. So I think that uh, it is important to establish a referral system, if possible, at your institution. Uh, but uh, this is not always possible. Uh, we know that there has been uh, difficulties in access to dermatologists, and this has been evidenced uh, from a study published from UCSF in which uh, a dermatologist, uh, Jack Resnick, did a study in which he called over 851 uh, dermatology offices across the country pretending to be a patient, saying that he had a mole or an EVUS that was changing. And as you may know for dermatologists, that is one of the most uh, emergent conditions because it could indicate a melanoma. It turns out that when he asked for an appointment, the median wait, wait time for appointment was about 38 days. So certainly in your patients that are receiving uh, cytotoxic agents or targeted therapies, and your patient has or, uh, skin toxicity in which they need an evaluation by a dermatologist, you cannot wait 38 days. So it's important to establish a, a referral system in which your patients are seen in a more timely fashion uh, or there may be other alternatives, such as learning how to deal with these toxicities. And if you were not already busy enough dealing with hematopoietic, gastrointestinal, and neurologic toxicities, now with these novel agents, as we will see tomorrow, uh, dermatologic toxicities have become even more prominent. But going back to this study that uh, Dr. Resnick conducted, he followed it up a year later with a similar study, but this time, when he called dermatology offices, he said that he was calling for an appointment uh, to receive Botox for wrinkles on his forehead. And what he found was that the median wait time this time was only about eight days. So um, my suggestion is that if you do not have a good uh, rapport with a dermatologist and you are uncertain about a skin toxicity and you need a dermatologist to see your patients, perhaps say that your patient is interested in Botox and they will be seen more uh, readily. So the skin, as you may know, is the largest organ in your body. If you were to stretch it out, it covers about uh, two square meters. Uh, it comprises about 15% of your total body weight. It acts as a barrier, uh, preventing infections and uh, radiation from reaching your internal organs. It regulates your temperature uh, by vasodilation or vasoconstriction. Of course, it receives many sensory impulses, and uh, it also uh, helps in, in synthesizing vitamin D and it's one of the major contributors of vitamin D in your patients. And what are the different layers of skin? The outermost layer is shown here. Some of you may remember this uh, from school, uh, but this is, the, this is known as the epidermis, which is uh, the, the layer that is on the surface of the skin. Uh, this layer is about uh, 150 to 300 microns in thickness. It is uh, primarily composed in 90% of the cells are keratinocytes. Uh, it, is, it also has melanocytes, dendritic cells, and Langerhans cells. It also has free nerve endings, which allow the skin to become that important sensory organ. It is important to note and to, as to why so many of your patients are affected with dermatologic toxicities. And you will see that if you ask virtually every patient that you are uh, treating with a cytotoxic agent, they will say that they have dry skin. Uh, is because every 28 days, uh, you will have a completely new layer of epidermis. So this basal layer heel here will undergo a normal process of proliferation and upwards migration and differentiation, and then they become these apoptotic or dead keratinocytes, which are the ones responsible for retaining the moisture in your bodies before being released into the environment. So every 28 days, this cycle goes through and, uh, and patients will have a new layer of epidermis. Every day you lose about a, protein, uh, a gram and a half of protein through this process. Every, uh, every day uh, you will also lose about 30,000 cells in this manner. And uh, one important fact is that um, the dust in your home is really not all dust coming from the outside. It is estimated from uh, studies that have been done that about 50% the, of the dust in your homes is the own skin you've been shedding as you go about your homes. 
Underneath this layer is another layer known as the dermis. This layer is thicker. It's about uh, half to three millimeters in thickness, and it contains the fibroblasts, the hair follicles, uh, the, uh, the muscles that are uh, responsible for uh, mobilizing the hairs, as you can see there, as well as the vessels and the sebaceous glands. This layer is the most important for providing structural support in the skin. And this is a layer that contains collagen, elastin, and hyaluronic acid, and it's the one that is broken down with age, and the collagen that is damaged in this layer is the reason why we develop wrinkles uh, with age, and it ha really has nothing to do with dehydration of this outermost layer here, uh, the epidermis. Moving, moving on to the, uh, to, an, to the third layer and final layer is the hypodermis or subcutaneous fat. Uh, this is a layer which mostly provides mechanical protection and insulation uh, from, uh, from um, thermal uh, injury. And uh, this layer, of course, is a layer that we don't like to have too much of, so I will just go on to the next topic. Uh, also important to know your skin is an immunologic organ, and we tend to forget this, but uh, the skin uh, contains about 100 trillion bacteria in each one of us. There's over 100 species of bacteria in your bodies. Uh, bacteria on the skin comprise about, and your gut comprise about one to 3% of your body weight. Uh, there are three different zones in your skin, as you can see here, the moist zones, oily or dry. These are considered to be the oily areas, the face and behind the ears, as well as the chest. And this is, as you will see tomorrow, the areas where you most frequently, uh, your patients will develop the acneiform rash to EGFR inhibitors because sebaceous glands are critically involved. Dry areas of the body uh, are also uh, important, uh, such as the palms and soles. Uh, and these areas are, are, as well as the buttocks here, and these areas, um, of course, overlap, but it's important to remember them because these are the areas, for example, when you have patients that are treated with uh, EGFR inhibitors also that cause dry skin, the patients will develop these very painful cracks or fissures in their palms and soles because those are some of the driest areas in the body. And then you have moist areas. And these areas, uh, bacteria, uh, love these areas, uh, especially proteobacteria, and these areas uh, include the areas under the axilla, uh, in the groin, and in the popliteal area. So you will get frequent infections in these locations uh, in your patients that are neutropenic. Importantly, odor in the uh, axilla, for example, does not really come from sweat, but just from bacteria that is present and metabolizes uh, the dead keratinocytes in this, and the sweat in those locations. So it's not your own, so you can, you can say that it's not your own body that is producing body odor, it's the bacteria, um, if, uh, if you ever uh, come across that. And then, uh, for, for those of us that uh, think we have clean feet, uh, you can see here that uh, this study that was published in Science in 2009 that characterized the uh, microbiome of the human uh, body showed that, they, that it found on average 14 different species of fungus in the feet of normal individuals. Not surprisingly, so many patients, two thirds of your patients or even healthy individuals will have onychomycosis and tinea pedis over the age of 65. It is not only bacteria living in our bodies that you or your patients may be under attack. A uh, study conducted in Raleigh uh, Durham uh, by entomologists uh, or, uh, that was published uh, earlier this year um, uh, showed that when these individuals, these scientists, went to 50 different homes across this area and they tried to characterize what arthropods and what um, bugs were present in normal homes of people to ascertain the impact of these, uh, of these uh, organisms in human health, what they found was a variety of organisms. They found over 150 different types of, uh, of these kinds of arthropods and animals in normal people's homes. Uh, you can see here the most common animals that they found were, were these uh, flies as well as uh, spiders and uh, the other very common uh, organism they found were uh, cockroaches. They weren't, however, the traditional uh, cockroach we know as the German cockroach. They found a much larger uh, type of cockroaches in these areas. Uh, so again, uh, we, it's not only our bodies that are covered with my, microbes, but also where we live in our environments. It, uh, it turns out that these arthropods also uh, can transmit disease and can um, uh, exacerbate uh, any of your patients' uh, 
underlying dermatologic conditions. They, uh, these investigators also uh, characterized the variety of species that they found uh, in these homes uh, depending on the size of the, uh, of the respective homes. So as you can see here, homes ranged all the way from 800 feet to over uh, 4,800 feet. And they found a greater diversity of these arthropods uh, and the species of arthropods, the larger the house was in. So this is at least uh, some, uh, uh, I think, um, a consolation for us that live in Manhattan, that we live in small homes there, at least we know we don't have as many bugs because our homes are so small. So where else does dermatology and oncology intersect? Well, I think this historical timeline shows this very uh, clearly, uh, and I will just go through it. Uh, uh, starting from 1901, in which uh, radium was used against cancer in some uh, papers described for the first time, was used by a dermatologist in Paris for the treatment of a skin cancer. Then in 1902, the first uh, de facto uh, dermatologic adverse event uh, was uh, reported to a therapeutic intervention um, or diagnostic intervention in oncology. And this was uh, the hands of a, of a radiology tech uh, that developed these multiple skin cancers. Uh, and this was described in 1902. Then uh, another important milestone was in 1949 when the studies of Goodman and Gilman uh, through, the, through the investigation of mechlorethamine, uh, the development of mechlorethamine from mustard gas uh, led to the approval of the first cytotoxic agent by the US Food and Drug Administration. And uh, that, of course, uh, led to uh, the, you know, the, the initiation of uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and then, uh, it, up until 1962, uh, a very interesting finding was observed in women receiving fluorouracil for breast cancer and published in a dermatology journal in 1962, skin changes in patients treated with fluorouracil, in which uh, two investigators uh, from Pretoria found that women receiving fluorouracil were having inflammation of the actinic keratosis or precancerous lesions in the skin. And remarkably, this observation led now to the use of topical fluorouracil for the treatment of actinic keratosis or precancerous uh, squamous cell carcinoma lesions in, in people's skin. And it's something we have available commercially. So as you can see here, uh, what seemed to be a negative uh, adverse event resulted in a positive therapeutic intervention. Then in 1971, uh, uh, hallmark of course with the, uh, the State of the Union Address, President Richard Nixon declared the war on cancer and uh, uh, this was a remarkable contribution. Uh, at the time, President Nixon said he hoped this would be remembered as the most important day of his administration. We know that exactly did not happen. However, it did lead uh, uh, the efforts that make the U.S. Uh, a leader uh, today in the fight against cancer. And then uh, in 2007, uh, it, uh, there was one of the first ASCO sessions on dermatologic toxicities presented by Pat LaRusso from Carmanos at the time. She's now at Yale. And the MASC, uh, at MASC which is the Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer, uh, that had been established for several decades, uh, there was no skin toxicity study group, and it was established in 2007. So now I would like to discuss um, another uh, component or where dermatology and um, oncology intersect. Uh, I, I feel like uh, I'm sure that many of you did not know that uh, a dermatologic cancer uh, demonstrated or, what, or showed which was the first cause of chemical carcinogenesis. And this was demonstrated uh, by Dr. Percival Pott in England in which uh, at the time in 1775, he demonstrated that chimney sweeps uh, developed scrotal cancer due to the soot after they went up and down the chimneys. I have been studying the various forms of cancer that plague our society. It has come to my attention that people of certain occupations have higher frequencies of certain types of cancer than the general public. In particular, chimney sweeps have a high rate of cancer of the scrotum. Young boys often enter this profession because they are able to squeeze down narrow chimneys. Once inside, they spend hours scraping clean the accumulated tars that would otherwise cause disastrous chimney fires. Sweeps are continually covered with soot, tar, and dust, and since they are not known for bathing with any regularity, the dust remains trapped in the folds of the skin. 
I believe that some agent in the coal tar, when exposed to the scrotum for many years, actually causes this disease. So this was the first demonstration of, uh, or, or the first hypothesis of chemical carcinogenesis, believe it or not. Uh, once I presented this video, uh, when I was uh, speaking about cancer to a lay audience, and uh, someone stood up at the, after I presented the video, and they said they didn't believe this. And I thought they were going to come up with some kind of uh, scientific rationale. And uh, what they came up with is because, well, we didn't have uh, recorders, video recorders back then. So how is that possible that he's saying that? Uh, so then uh, another uh, intersection of dermatology and oncology occurred uh, when in 1915 the first experimental cancer induction was conducted in a scientific manner when Professor Yamagiwa from uh, Japan, what he did, he took rabbits and he took it, the rabbit's ears and painted tar, coal tar, for 660 days every day. And what he found was that this led to the development of squamous cell carcinoma in the rabbit's ears. And there is a museum now in London where you can actually see the ear of the first rabbit that he caused that uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, another, uh, another intersection of dermatology and oncology, of course, is uh, through the human papilloma virus. We know that every year about 27,000 people develop HPV-related cancers. And this uh, virus has a relatively long history, uh, but HPV 16 and 18 were discovered in 1982. And uh, then uh, later that, uh, in the next two decades, it was demonstrated that this virus was able to be uh, carcinogenic. As you know, HPV is responsible for ca causing genital warts as well as warts in the skin. So some of which can convert into squamous cell carcinoma. And this is of great importance because of the approval of the uh, vaccine against, cervical, uh, against uh, HPV infections and consequently cervical cancer. And also led to uh, the, um, the investigator uh, that identified uh, this potential, uh, Professor Surhausen from Germany, to receive the Nobel Prize in 2008. But this is, not the, the, uh, this is not where all this story about HPV and warts started and its possible association with cancer or other dermatologic diseases. Uh, some of you may have been to Naples, Italy. There is this beautiful church called San Domenico di Maggiore in, uh, in Naples that was built in the 14th century. And this is the outside of this uh, church. What is remarkable about this church is that inside, uh, you can see here this beautiful uh, um, the, the beautiful architecture and decoration. But what is remarkable about this is that these are all coffins. And these are coffins from noble families from Naples and Aragon and the, that part of Spain at the time. And uh, these, uh, these, uh, the, the bodies of these people were embalmed and they are still there. Uh, an effort was, under, uh, uh, was undertaken by the Italian government several years ago. And what they did is they went out and they analyzed what diseases these uh, cadavers may have had. And uh, one of these is notable for our lecture today because it uh, is a dermatologic disease. And uh, this disease was, two diseases were identified in uh, a noble woman uh, that was called Mary of Aragon. And Mary, uh, as this is her body at the time, was the quintessential noble woman. She be belonged to something called the Circle of Ischia which was a group of people that got together every afternoon to read poetry. She was friends with Michelangelo. Uh, she was in the highest levels of society. Uh, what was interesting, as, as you can see here, is that there is this edema, this severe edema of the lower, left lower extremity, which was, uh, was discovered after uh, investigation of her tissues was caused because she had a, a syphilitic gamma. So she had syphilis. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Mary also had these prominent lesions around her vulva. So uh, these lesions histologically were analyzed and showed that they were indeed warts. So apparently Mary's uh, poetry club was a very uh, exciting one uh, because it was found that uh, when they extracted the DNA from this, these warts that it was HPV 18. So as you can see, this is a very old disease and uh, only now we are identifying uh, the potential of uh, seeing these viruses as targets to prevent uh, malignancies. Another uh, factor where skin has, uh, has helped us understand cancer better is the, um, 
the understanding or the epiphany that cancer is more prevalent in certain parts of the world. Uh, for example, we know that Australia is by far the capital of skin cancer uh, in all of the world. And non-melanoma skin cancer, which includes basal cell and, and squamous cell carcinoma, as you can see, only occurs in 58 out of 100,000 people in Finland, more than double that amount in the UK, in the US uh, also uh, almost uh, six times that amount, but in Australia, look at this, over 3,100 uh, cases per 100,000 compared to only 58 in Finland when, where there is really no, uh, no real sunlight. What about melanoma? The same thing with melanoma. Just to compare, in the US, it's about 15 per 100,000. In Australia, it's more than double that amount. So what it, why is the cause for that? Why, why is it that the environment re induces more cancer? Well, this could be explained by several reasons. One is that people that live close to the equator, uh, in, in, in terms of human development, uh, it uh, appears that uh, they have developed darker skin uh, to protect them from sun exposure and from the damaging effects of ultraviolet radiation. So skin color, according to Nina Jablonski and many other investigators who know about the topic, is nothing other, other than natural sunscreen. Because as you can see here, people that live close to the equator have darker skin, and if you analyze the histology of a person with light skin versus dark skin, you will see that there is no difference in the number of melanocytes in their skin. The only difference is in the activity of those melanocytes, how active they are, and how they synthesize uh, the melanosomes, which give skin its color. So now you understand why uh, people in Australia have the highest incidence of skin cancer, especially in recent decades, when compared to people in Europe. Because when people from uh, Ireland, especially, were sent to Australia uh, in the, in the, in the past, several centuries ago, these people had not evolved, their skin had not evolved to be in a place that is so close to the equator, and that is why you see that Aboriginal uh, individuals from Australia do not have skin cancer, whereas the uh, recent arrivals, the Irish and so forth, are responsible for the highest rate of skin cancer in the world, because their skin is not meant to be in that environment. And what is, the envi what is it in the environment? It's the ultraviolet radiation. So ultraviolet radiation is radiation that comes from the sun. There are several different types of ultraviolet radiation. Uh, for uh, clinical purposes, ultraviolet radiation C is not important because it, it's up, the ozone layer will protect us from it. Uh, we do have to uh, worry about ultraviolet radiation B and ultraviolet radiation A. You live in such a beautiful location that is usually sunny and has nice weather, and it's important to know this because some of your patients can get sunburned if they are on photosensitizing drugs just by driving two hours in their cars coming to your office or, or being in their homes if they have a big window because ultraviolet radiation B is, uh, is that cannot go through window glass, but ultraviolet radiation A, which is the one responsible for photosensitivity, does. So your patients on vimurafenib, vandetinib, or many other cytotoxic agents or antibiotics for other, uh, that you're giving them for other reasons can get photosensitivity even being inside their cars or being inside their homes. So why is this important? Because there are sunscreens that can protect that you can recommend to your patients to protect them against UVB and UVA. And this is an example of a patient, just to emphasize the importance of UVA in aging, of the, in, in damaging the skin. Uh, this, is, this patient was a truck driver for about 30 years in Illinois. So in Illinois, as you can imagine, he probably was in his truck with the window closed most of the year because there's only about two months of summer in Chicago. And what you can see here is the inside of his face, the right side of his face facing inside, the left side of his face facing the window glass, where the UVA radiation could go through, which is the one that causes burns in your patients, and the one that also causes aging in, in you or in your patients, in all of us. You can see the aging of the skin. Therefore, it's important to protect against ultraviolet radiation A. And now, uh, I would like to uh, briefly speak about uh, the uh, importance of, uh, and why also uh, tanning has become such an important uh, consequence uh, of us uh, or, or origin for skin cancer in our society. Now that war is over, Americans are ready to relax and enjoy their freedom. What better place to recuperate than at the beach? Women have cast aside the Victorian fashions of yesteryear and adopted the risque swimsuit. Sunbathers say the more skin, the better. 
Be warned, however, all this skin and sun can lead to painful burns. And now doctors warn of a possible connection between the sun's rays and skin cancer. Perhaps the unseen ultraviolet rays that fade our clothes can also damage skin and lead to deadly disease. A healthy tan may not be so healthy after all. As you can see, this was 60 years ago. People were already talking about this. But some people didn't pay attention because some people, not only did they live to tan, but they tan to live, apparently. Like, uh, as you may know who this gentleman is, George Hamilton. Uh, but we cannot blame it on him. Actually, it was the French who made uh, tanning fashionable. Coco Chanel was said to uh, be uh, at a yacht with the Duke of Wellington, and uh, she just got uh, sun uh, tanned by accident, uh, being in the uh, outside uh, part of the yacht. And when she came out, there were all these photographers and paparazzi that saw her, and she looked beautiful tanned. So apparently, this is what initiated uh, the tanning as being a fashionable thing for people to do. But it was uh, an investigator here in the US who, who invented sunscreen. And I just want to briefly take you through his history because I feel uh, honored that I, uh, c I did my residency at University of Chicago where Dr. Steven Rothman uh, arrived from Hungary and was the chair there between 1942 and 1960. I did not do my residency in 19 between 1942 and 1960. Uh, but he was there during that time, so I didn't know him, but I did, I was trained by people who were trained by him. Uh, so he was the, he was uh, the person who brought investigative dermatology into the U.S. So how did he discover sunscreen? Well, Dr. Rothman was, uh, saw a patient that developed a mole, that had a mole that was suspicious for skin cancer. So what he did is he injected uh, Novocaine or Procaine into this patient to excise, to anesthetize, and to excise the skin cancer. And uh, he told the patient to come back a week later uh, to remove the sutures. Uh, so, and what Dr. Rothman found was that the patient had been to the beach, and the patient was uh, sunburned uh, after he went to the beach uh, in his skin, except in the area where he had injected the, uh, the uh, Novocaine or Procaine. So Dr. Rothman did what any sensible man would do. He was puzzled by this. And uh, so what any sensible man would have done after seeing something like this is that he went home and he told his wife. Lucky for him, his wife was a pharmacist. And she told him that procaine or novocaine was an ester of paraminobenzoic acid. So paraminobenzoic acid could be applied safely to the skin, uh, leading to the development of the first type of sunscreen. And that's how PABA, or paraminobenzoic acid, became a sunscreen for decades, which is now not used as commonly because it can lead to allergies in the skin. And it is part of a type of sunscreens called chemical sunscreens, which act by releasing infrared radiation or heat, as you can see here. And um, these protect against most types of ultraviolet radiation, but mostly ultraviolet radiations B, which is the one in the past that was thought to be the only one important because it's higher energy. But uh, as I hope I have convinced you, ultraviolet radiation A is also important. On the other hand, we now have physical sunscreens. Uh, these are nanoparticles of titanium dioxide or zinc oxide, which uh, when applied to the skin act like millions of tiny little mirrors and reflect all types of ultraviolet radiation. So this is the ideal thing in you, to use in your patients and in yourselves. In the past, people didn't like these because they were gritty, but now the technology has improved uh, significantly and they, uh, can, they can be spread very easily uh, along the skin. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy as to whether sunscreens work. Uh, just to, wanted to uh, reiterate that sunscreens uh, have been demonstrated in randomized trials to prevent uh, skin cancer. Uh, the first trial in 2003 published in Lancet showed that in over 1,300 patients in Australia, in the coast of Australia, uh, patients treated with sunscreen had a lower number of squamous cell carcinomas uh, when compared to their counterparts that did not use sunscreen. And more recently in JCO in 2011, melanoma was also shown to be decreased in patients that, uh, uh, that used sunscreen, as you can see here in the blue line, when compared to patients that did not use sunscreen. So uh, there is uh, uh, significant evidence that sunscreens do work to prevent skin cancers and uh, also the thought is that it also prevent aging because of the, uh, the reasons I mentioned before as to UVA and aging. The reason sunscreens do not work is because people don't use enough of them and people don't use them frequently enough. Studies have shown that people only apply between 20 to 60% of sunscreen needed to, to, uh, to be uh, protective enough. Uh, every time 
uh, patient applies sunscreen to their entire body, they should apply about 35 ml, so about one ounce at every application. And this should be repeated every two hours or every hour if swimming or sweating. So as you, can, uh, as you probably know already, uh, I know some of you are probably thinking I certainly wasn't applying enough sunscreen. Uh, people are not applying enough of it and are not applying it frequently enough. So this is uh, something that was developed by a dermatologist uh, to try to make it more, more easy for people. Uh, the teaspoon rule, so it's used more than a half a teaspoon on the head and neck area and on each upper extremity, and then use more than a teaspoon on the anterior and posterior torso and the right and uh, left legs. So again, uh, important to remember this and also to remember that uh, over um, 15, uh, there is really not a significant difference uh, between 15 and 30. Uh, there is some difference between what the American Academy of Dermatology and the FDA recommends, but uh, pretty much anything over 15, uh, if the patient applies enough of it and correctly, should suffice in terms of preventing photosensitivity or, um, uh, or um, uh, skin cancers. Another uh, important um, in interaction between dermatology and oncology is that some of the uh, first uh, areas or one of the first uh, media by which people were uh, educated about cancer were beauty magazines that traditionally would talk about skin and skin care, et cetera. And this was uh, initially uh, uh, released in, in a journal called the Ladies Home Journal in 1913 because people were so scared about cancer that the government launched a campaign so people would not be so terrorized uh, uh, because of it. Uh, so. Uh, so they, they launched these articles in these, um, in these magazines, in Beauty Lifestyle magazines, and then even Helena Rubinstein, which as you know, she has a, um, a beauty line, also published articles about, um, about uh, sun damage uh, or sun causing damage on the skin and how to prevent it. And dermatology has also been important because I think has emphasized uh, the role that caregivers and patients have in being their own advocates. And I think you would all agree with me how important it is to have a patient's family member when they go visit your office. I find it extremely important because I, t I usually prescribe for dermatologic disease topical medications. So in contrast to IV medications where the patient is sitting passively and they receive their IV uh, cytotoxic agent or other agent that you're administering, when you ask someone to apply a cream every day to their bodies, it takes a lot of energy and effort, and people do not do it consistently most of the time. And this was demonstrated uh, in a study from uh, North Carolina by a dermatologist in which uh, Stephen Feldman uh, used uh, tubes of cream for patients with psoriasis, and the caps of the tubes had, had these microchips that would tell him how many times the patients opened and closed them. But the patients did not know this. So he gave patients the, the prescription of the tubes of the topical steroids, and then when he asked patients uh, if they had been applying their, their creams as he instructed, uh, they said that they did 90% um, of the time. But when he checked with the, with the uh, microchips how many times the bottles had been opened, he found that only about a third of patients had really been applying it as he had instructed them. So don't be surprised if one of the reasons that the medications topically are not working is because the patients are not applying it. And I find this uh, especially problematic in men uh, over the age of 50, for example. And um, I, I think most men will agree with me. And in fact, um, men as patients ag agree with me uh, almost always in which they, they will even ask me to talk to their spouse because they will not remember or they have never even applied. There are some men that have never applied a cream in their bodies. So they will not know how to apply it. So it's important to have uh, another person there especially when treating dermatologic disease. And also to see what is going on in the patient. And what demonstrated this? That we cannot always see uh, or know what is happening in our patients. And for that, I would like to share with you this study. This was a study in which 216 patients diagnosed with melanoma uh, were surveyed as to who diagnosed their melanoma. And what was found in this study was that in more than half of these patients, it was the patients themselves that brought to the doctor's attention that they had a, a mole that was changing and that was indeed the melanoma. So it's important for people to be aware of these themselves. Only in 25% of cases was a melanoma diagnosed by a doctor, dermatologist or primary care doctor. And in about 20%, it was a family member. 
But then these investigators took this study a step further and they, they identified by gender who was more likely to identify melanoma. Not surprisingly, they found that more women uh, were uh, likely to diagnose their own melanoma than men, almost twice as many. But then they did something more interesting in terms of uh, talking about spouses and, um, or, or, or uh, partners. What they did in this case is when a patient had a melanoma diagnosed by a family member, they asked if it was the wife that discovered the melanoma in the husband or the husband in the wife. Uh, and uh, they published their results. And um, I would like to know, uh, members of the audience, uh, who, um, to re please raise your hands, whoever thinks that uh, women would be more likely to find a melanoma in their husband than a husband and their wife. Okay, we have one. Okay, almost, uh, almost all of you. Uh, and uh, who thinks that a man would be more likely to discover a melanoma in his wife? Okay, we have half a hand, 1.5 hands. <laughs> okay, uh, so yes, I guess uh, the majority wins. Uh, as you can see here, women were 10 times more likely to diagnose melanoma in their husbands than men were in their women. So for you ladies in the audience today, please, for skin cancer surveillance, you cannot rely on your husbands, so please see a dermatologist or uh, do it yourselves. Now I'm gonna conclude by talking about hair because tomorrow I'll be I will be talking about hair toxicities and hair and chemotherapy-induced alopecia, as you, as you may know, uh, is going to become an even more important topic in your practices. In, in December of last year, the FDA cleared the first scalp cooling device to prevent chemotherapy-induced alopecia. So it's going to be a matter of time before patients come banging in your door asking you to cool their scalp so they don't lose their hair during uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, so, uh, as a matter of background, I would like to introduce you to uh, the hair follicle and some important facts about hair. This is uh, the typical uh, presentation of the hair in your bodies and in your patients' uh, bodies. This is the hair shaft, as you can see here, that develops from the hair matrix, which is located, as you can see here, deep in your skin. So these cells basically will lead to the uh, apoptosis of uh, keratinocytes and differentiation, and keratin and pigment from melanocytes in this area are what is going to make a hair shaft. So hair is, hair essentially is this hair shaft structure is dead tissue. So when people say, oh, if I trim my hair or if I shave my, my hair, it's gonna grow faster. That is not true. That hair does not feel anything. Nothing is gonna happen if you uh, cut your hair in a different way, in a different angle, or things like that because the hair is already dead. In addition to that, it's important to know also that uh, every hair uh, also has a muscle attached. Um, so if anyone ever tells you that you're not working out enough, you tell them, I have muscle all over my body. Uh, every, every hair in my body uh, has a muscle. And these are hairs that when people get uh, cold is like a defense mechanism that um, is the erector pili muscle. And then we have the sebaceous glands we will talk more about tomorrow during uh, EGFR inhibitors. Also importantly, uh, there's about five million hair follicles throughout your entire bodies. There's about 100,000 hairs on your scalp. Each eyebrow has about 150 hairs. There's about uh, uh, 100 hairs on your upper eyelash and about 75 on your lower eyelash. And this is important as we will see tomorrow because for patients that lose eyelashes, some of the eyelash loss can be permanent with cytotoxic agents. There are three cycles of hair growth. So there's the antigen cycle in which hair grows. Hairs will grow between two to six years, and then they will undergo another cycle called catagen. Uh, this is a very short cycle. It's only about two or three weeks in which the hair undergoes apoptosis, and then the hair undergoes another uh, a period known as telogen or the rest phase. Uh, and this rest phase is the one that's gonna last about three weeks and then it gives a way to the new hair to grow underneath. So an individual hair will, in your scalp will only grow about two to six years. It will not grow indefinitely. It will die and then allow another hair to grow. Interestingly, uh, hair in the scalp, about 90% is growing continuously, whereas only 10% of hairs on the eyebrow. And in the eyebrow, the duration of this hair cycle is shorter, and that's why you don't grow very long, bushy uh, eyebrows. Although that appears to, t to change with age, 
because it appears that especially men with age, we tend to grow more long eyebrows and eyelashes. So another important thing about this is that because the hairs undergo this process, it is normal for patients and for us to know that we are, we are supposed to lose between 100 to 200 hairs every day. It is absolutely normal to lose hairs every day. So cytotoxic chemotherapy is thought to act on this, uh, at this level of the hair cycle, the antigen uh, phase, and interrupt the growth and cause apoptosis and premature hair loss. And this is indeed what happens in the majority of patients receiving cytotoxic agents, especially adromycin, cytoxin, uh, taxanes, and a variety of other agents, but alkylating agents, uh, anthracyclines especially, uh, can cause uh, alopecia, as you know. Um, studies in terms of quality of life have shown that this is the most feared uh, adverse event in about 77% of patients. It, it can lead to social isolation. Uh, some women with breast cancer have reported that it can affect their self-image more than mastectomy. Uh, other uh, patients have reported that they would consider refusing chemo because of this or that they would even consider chemo that they, they may think it's less effective if they wouldn't uh, lose their hair. And, um, and this is something that I do see. Some patients say that they chose CMF instead of AC and Taxol because they didn't want to lose as much hair. What about when patients recover their hair? It's important to know also that uh, hair starts regrowing after two to three months after they lost it with cytotoxic agents. But studies that have been mostly anecdotal and uncontrolled have shown that about two-thirds of patients report changes in density, color, and structure after their hair grows, after they lose it, after cytotoxic agents. These are two patients. This is patient one in baseline. You can see here straight hair. After she lost it and regrew it, it was curly, and vice versa. And a patient with curly hair regrew straight hair. And this will last for about two to three years after chemotherapy. In addition, I mentioned before that the hair color is given by the pigment or melanocytes within the hair pigmentation unit. And you may have noticed in some of your patients treated with these kinase inhibitors of block kit, such as sunitinib, uh, imatinib, pasopinib, uh, and other agents of this class, they lead to uh, temporary depigmentation of the hair, as you can see here. As you know, the characteristic administration of sutent is four weeks on, two weeks off. You can see here the periodic de- and repigmentation of hair. And these events have been recapitulated in mice, as you can see in this uh, slide. And this differs from the depigmentation of hairs that, did, that occurs with the checkpoint inhibitors, which is more of a permanent depigmentation of the hair, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. So uh, what it, why, is, uh, why is hair pigmentation important? Because there are some mutations in, in the hair uh, or in, in the melanocytes that may lead to different colors in hair. For example, there is a receptor in melanocytes uh, that uh, when uh, under normal circumstances, when it is activated by this uh, protein called melanocyte stimulating hormone and the receptor known as the melanocortin receptor one leads to the formation of a certain type of melanin or the protein that leads to the, hair, to the skin color and hair color that is dark and leads to people having dark hair as you can see here. On the other hand, some people have a mutation in this melanocortin receptor and they do not synthesize this robust type of melanin and instead uh, people and animals develop red hair. So mutations in this MCR, uh, melanocortin receptor one, have been identified as being causal in the development of red hair in the individuals that have red hair, as you can see here, and they synthesize two different types of melanin. Eumelanin in this individual with dark hair and pheomelanin, as it's called in people with red hair. In addition, other species have shown that even the formation of color in the hair and in the skin can be heat sensitive. For example, we know that we get darkening of the skin after exposure to UV radiation because it synthesizes, uh, the skin synthesizes more melanocyte stimulating hormone leading to increased color in the skin because it leads to the activity of an enzyme called tyrosinase, which in turn will lead to the formation of more uh, uh, melanosomes or melanin, which gives skin its color. And that's why we get a dark tan. Interestingly, in some species, this uh, temperature sensitivity is different. What appears to happen is that uh, the uh, parts of the body that are cooler uh, are the only parts in which this enzyme is active. And you can see this in the Siamese cat where the cooler parts of the body are areas uh, that are dark because these are the only areas where the tyrosinase is active. And it's not only the Siamese cat, but other species such as this Himalayan mouse have also been found to have this type of effect. 
And then it's important to remember also that some patients will never recover their hair after chemotherapy, and this is something that only recently has been identified, especially with docetaxel. Uh, we've seen a number of patients and children treated with busulfan. Uh, it is estimated that, that between 10 to 30% of these patients never fully recover their hair. And also something that was published recently, patients that receive aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen as adjuvant therapies also may not develop full alopecia, but some hair thinning and more on that uh, tomorrow. But something very important, because I have to say, I've never seen a patient upset with the oncologist. The only times that I have seen them upset is when they, they come and they said, they told me my hair was gonna fall off and was gonna come back and it never fully came back. Or they told me that I was gonna be on tamoxifen for 10 years or an astrosol for 10 years and they never told me my hair was gonna get thin and look at my scalp right now. That, those are the only times where I've seen patients uh, upset in that way. So what can be done uh, to prevent hair loss? We'll talk more about it tomorrow because what was attempted in the past, such as this tourniquet to prevent blood flow to the scalp, this was tried in Europe many decades ago for obvious reasons, it didn't catch on. Uh, then some people became more sophisticated using this cuff to prevent the blood flow, but these devices were not only impractical, but they were ineffective. So tomorrow we'll talk about what really works. So to conclude, um, I hope I have convinced you that dermatology and oncology are very close disciplines and it's important for us to really communicate well and know each other. Uh, dermatologic health is important in your patients. Uh, I think the importance of dermatologic health with, will increase when, when uh, patients uh, enter adjuvant therapies as they will be less willing to tolerate uh, these quality of life issues. Uh, when you combine therapies, for example, we've seen with the recent use of ipilimumab and nivolumab, patients develop severe rash in uh, over half of the cases. Um, or when you combine cytotoxic agents with radiation or targeted therapies. And obviously, the wonderful things that you are doing for these patients that they are living longer, now uh, the, they are worrying about these quality of life issues. So I think it's a consequence of the great things you're doing for them that they are able to worry about this. So this is a book that, um, that uh, we wrote with Harborside Press uh, for patients. Uh, and also I think it's a very basic book that talks about some of the things I've talked about today. Uh, so uh, before concluding, I just wanted to mention, uh, and if I've accomplished my mission, uh, you uh, can say what caused these uh, effects in these patients. Uh, you are experts now in skin disease and, and hair color, uh, so I'm sure that you all know what caused uh, the, um, the hair change on the left and on the right. I think you know that on the left, uh, actually it's President Obama's gray hair uh, after he took office though. Uh, as you can see, because before he took office, his hair was, uh, as you can see here, much darker. And this on the right was a patient receiving sunitinib uh, and experiencing that periodic repigmentation. So certainly, uh, I think that uh, President Obama shows us that uh, uh, it's important to change, uh, especially the skin of your patients. Thank you very much.